United Methodist Church Modesto for our Easter celebration. I am Pastor Deborah Brady. And you know, during our Lenten season, we put away our alleluias, but we bring them out in full force on Easter Sunday. So there is a traditional greeting that we do on Easter. When someone says, Christ is risen, you respond, Christ is risen indeed, and we all say alleluia. Are you ready? Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. Online community, we welcome you. Though we can't see you, we feel your presence. We hope you'll use the chat space and whatever platform you're on to greet one another in cyberspace. Everything that you need will be on the screen, and you can find an order of worship on our homepage on our website. Visitors and guests, we're delighted to have you with us today. Uh, please Feel free to participate as you're comfortable because we're going to invite you to stand and sit and join in prayers and liturgy and music. We hope that you'll email us or fill out the registration card if you're in person. Let us know how we can come alongside you and support you in your own life of faith. So now, let's bring our full attention to this moment, feeling our bodies wherever they are, opening our hearts, relaxing our minds, integrating all of the ways that we receive messages, guidance, presence from God. As you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel as we hear what's up. Hear this good news from the gospel of Mark chapter 16. 
When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Please join me in unison prayer. Ever-living God, we come with our heads bent down sometimes, overwhelmed with Good Friday news. Raise us up. Lift up our eyes so that we might look up and see the tenacity of life in the midst of death. Amen. Hear this assurance proclaimed in Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. God has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. In the name of Christ, new life is come. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
As a people forgiven and freed, we reach out to lift others up, offering the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Please pass the peace in words and gestures to your neighbors. Our next scripture reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Listen for God's word to us. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This ends our scripture reading through which the Spirit continues to teach the church. Thanks be to God. Today, in the celebration spirit of Easter, we have the opportunity for congregational singing during the choir anthem. So toward the end of the anthem, we will reprise Christ the Lord is risen today, singing verse one and a new verse. The words will be on the screen. As we approach that part of the anthem, I will turn around and give you a gesture to stand, and then we can join with the choir in singing that familiar tune that we opened the service with. Thank you. 
you may be seated. Ah, amen and alleluia. You know, as I begin this Easter proclamation, I want to just acknowledge the community of worship leaders, the orchestra, the choir who work, all of the people in the background. So I often get all the thank yous, but really, this is not a solo act. We have a whole community working together, and and what a blessing they are to me. Thank you, friends. I want to also acknowledge that so often my sermons are filled with ways that others' insights have moved me, uplifted me, including the pastors who are in my weekly discussion group, including so many people in this congregation who share their own stories with me, and I'm grateful for the way the Holy Spirit weaves it all together in me for you. And one person I just want to Uh, mention is someone I've quoted from before. If you are here regularly, she's um, familiar to you. Um, Debbie Thomas. She has been writing blogs and pieces for a long time. I followed her for years, and she now has two books out, Into the Mess and Other Stories About Jesus. And her newest book, just published recently, is A Faith of Many Rooms, Inhabiting a More Spacious Christianity. So I really commend her books to you. If you're restarting on the Christian faith or haven't been there, her Her access um, to just moving us spiritually is wonderful. I don't know her personally. I've never met her. I hope to sometime. But I just want to say how much her work has inspired me for today's message and many others. Let us pray. Oh God, receive the alleluias, the ones we sing with our hearts, the ones we, that silently echo in us. As we come to this time of reflection, we trust that in some way you are moving in us, speaking to us, calling us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and redeemer. Amen. Three days had passed. The women went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, as was the custom. No doubt the journey was heavy. I imagine them approaching with shoulders slumped, heads lowered in defeat and grief. Along the way, they suddenly realized They hadn't thought through all of the logistics. They had not taken into account how they were going to move the large stone over the opening to the tomb. I'm guessing they started discussing options, maybe looking for a large tree branch that together they could use as leverage. Maybe Mary was regretting that she didn't make her son James get out of bed and come with them to help. Maybe they even considered turning around and going home. But then they looked up, and it changed their lives. The barrier that they thought would be there was gone, and what they discovered instead was life. However, embracing the good news the discovery of of resurrection took some time for them. It did not happen right away, according to Mark's gospel. When Darren opened the service, we didn't actually read the last verse. This story comes in the last chapter of Mark's gospel. So I just want to read it again, and I'm going to back up to verse 6 for the context. But he, meaning the young man in the tomb in a white robe, he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place, the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. 
Now, so far, so good. This is how we ended the reading at the beginning of the service because we wanted to kind of strike this upbeat note to start with. But here is the last verse of the gospel. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The end. This is the closing line of the resurrection story in Mark's gospel. And this is why this gospel is not read very often on Easter Sunday. I looked through our records, it's been 15 years since we've read this version. Usually we read the version from John chapter 20, like we did at the sunrise service this morning. That gospel gives us tension and drama and it's so poignant. In contrast, Mark's version is disquieting. We get no glimpses of the risen Jesus. Peter and the other disciples are nowhere to be seen. The young man, who we assume is an angel, but we're not told that he is, makes an announcement of good news that inspires neither belief nor transformation. We witness no Easter proclamation No narrative arc from hopelessness to certitude. Instead, we witness fear, flight, and silence. During this Lenten season, I have been struck again and again by the enormity of what humanity has endured over the last year, over the last four years, really. I mean, we haven't really fully recovered from the pandemic. It still hangs on. We have witnessed and or sustained losses through wars on a scale we've barely begun to register, much less to grieve. We are worried about our future with climate change and stresses in our global economy. We are still experimenting with ways to resolve homelessness in our communities. Lots of us are wondering how are we gonna keep our wits about us and love our neighbors as we move further into a contentious election, election year. Maybe we find ourselves weary and numb and bewildered and sad. We hear what the angel at the tomb is saying to us and in some deep recess of our souls, we know the angel's words are the most consequential words we have ever heard, but we're still trembling in alarm. We're still holding on to something, trying not to flee. Maybe what we need in times like this is Mark's version of the story. Maybe we need time as the women in Mark's account needed time to sit with the terror and the amazement that must fall upon us when God's incomprehensible work of redemption collides in real time with broken bewilderment bewilderment of our lives. Maybe we don't need to shout right away. Maybe it's okay to whisper. This year, I'm allowing myself to practice a slow Easter, an Easter that takes root within me as imperceptibly as seeds break into life beneath the earth. Anyone who grows green things knows the process of transformation is hidden from our eyes. Every spring, it is shrouded in mystery. It has a timeline of its own and we tremble at its seeming fragility. And yet, the tender shoots break through the soil and new life emerges every time. Likewise, I believe that there is a life we cannot see, the life of God hidden in us, tenacious, dynamic, sure, It might take time to emerge and flourish, but the life itself is certain. What I respect about Mark's version of the story 
is that it honors this mystery. The text doesn't leap to explanation, to theology, to proof, to joy. It allows the bewilderment of the first witnesses to be exactly what it is. The narrative doesn't rush. The disciples were experiencing a kind of disorientation and grief. The good news was confusing. It didn't immediately erase all the trauma that they had been through over the last few days. Jesus' resurrection meant that he was with them, present, but he wasn't with them in the same way he used to be. They had trouble recognizing him. Jesus' wounds remained, but he was changed. He appeared and disappeared. And then he handed the ministry off to them, and they didn't feel ready. So often, I wish that we, the church, could be so patient, so nuanced, so attuned to spiritual and psychological reality when we speak and share our good news. Wouldn't our witness be so much more credible if we didn't feel the need to rush to resurrection, to slap smiles and bows on the wounds of the world? Have you ever noticed that when human beings are in profound pain, good news hurts? We find it too jarring, too dissonant, too grating. We can't map it or bridge it. We can't wrap our language around it. We literally can't take it into our bodies when we're in that much pain. Something tender and essential in us resists. At such moments, maybe the most faithful response to seeming disconnect between Christ's resurrection and our continuing pain is a reverent silence. The woman at the tomb waited before they spoke. They led with wounded awe, not premature consolation. I wonder if we collectively shy away from Mark's gospel because we don't trust the story to do its work. We feel some pious need to protect and embellish it. That is why, if you look in your own Bibles, you'll find that later generations of Christians added on nine more verses that were not in the original manuscripts. They don't fit the language, the style, and cadence of the rest of the gospel. Isn't this really good news? That the truth of the resurrection does not depend on the religious performance or the spiritual stamina of us flailing human beings. It doesn't matter one bit if we believe on the spot or not. The tomb is empty. Death is vanquished. Jesus lives, period. We are not in charge of Easter. God is. I'm grateful that the scriptures preserve the gap between God's all-sufficient work and our tenuous apprehension of it. Because it's a gap I know so well. I believe most of the time, but I don't yet understand. I cling to the resurrection, but I don't know what to do with death's ongoing cruelty. I trust that Jesus reigns, but I don't fully comprehend the elusive nature of his kingdom. I believe all things will be well, but I don't understand why they're not all well right now. St. Anselm of Canterbury's motto for the Christian life was this, faith seeking understanding. What have I experienced of Jesus so far? Can I hang on to the faith that is possible in light of my current experience, incomplete though it is? Can I wait in silence as the waves of alarm and fear and amazement and hope course through me, bringing me slowly, slowly to resurrection joy? 
We know from the complete witnesses of the four gospels that the frightened silence of the women on Easter morning eventually gave way to proclamation. Their alarm subsided, their courage deepened, their trauma healed, eased, and their amazement grew. They learned how to choose hope. We remember back to the Peter of Holy Week, though he had promised Jesus to stick with him to the bitter end, when the time came, he ardently denied, even angrily denied, having even known Jesus, not once, but three times. And now here in our Acts scripture lesson, after the resurrection, we hear Peter's sermon preached several months later, and we see that they learned how to make this story their own. And as they did, the story blossomed and grew in and among them. Joy came, faith came, peace came, love came. And slowly, a, the glorious truth of a conquered grave and a risen Messiah made its way from their emboldened lips to every corner of the world. The story didn't depend on them, but it changed them. And as they changed, the world around them changed too. One of the frequent questions I'm asked at the door after Easter Sunday when we use confetti like we did at the beginning is, who's gonna clean all this up? <laughs> Since Yona, our longtime custodian who used to do it, he retired some years ago, uh, we've had some volunteer or another uh, come in sometime early in the week and get everything vacuumed up with their power vac. Kathleen's going to do it this Tuesday in time for next Sunday, so it's back to normal. But you know, no matter how much we try or what technique we use, we can never manage to get all of the confetti vacuumed up. I know. Throughout the year, we continue to find stray pieces stuck in the pew cushion, inside of a hymnal, in the hymnal rack, somewhere stuck on the floor. And as we were preparing for Easter, I discovered that three of our members, Deborah Buckles, Kathleen Davis, and Lynette Grandison, have all developed a spiritual practice of saving the stray pieces of confetti that they find throughout the year, and they take them home. Now, I think what Lynette does is puts hers in her larger collection of confetti, which she inserts in birthday cards that she sends to all of us. So we get a birthday card with alleluias in it. Kathleen told me she keeps her jar in the kitchen in her home. Now, I'm thinking Kathleen probably looks at those, those pieces of Alleluia confettis and she thinks is a piece of music, like our opening hymn written by Charles Wesley, or maybe the Hallelujah Chorus in Handel's Messiah. Deborah Buckles told me that she has her confetti collection on a shelf in her bedroom with other keepsakes. And so she says she gets a lot of joy here in the sanctuary when she discovers a confetti. It's like a little Alleluia shouts at her. But then, in her bedroom, on a regular basis, she looks at that collection. It causes her to look up and touch base with what the Easter Alleluia joy welling up in her our heart all through the year. So we invite you today, as you're leaving, pick up a handful of confetti. <laughs> Start your own collection. We even provided little bags for you in the pews. So, they're kind of in the middle, so pass them to your neighbors, and you can start your own little Alleluia collection at home. The beautiful thing about taking something slowly is that we can savor it. We need to savor life right now, even as violence breathes down our necks. The future feels precarious. Many of our worst fears can run wild. Receive the good news of the resurrection slowly. Hold it, savor it, ponder it, 
as closely as you can in the moment. You don't have to force all of its goodness into your heart prematurely. It is trustworthy and it will wait for you. But when you can, as you can, look up and notice the barrier to life is removed. And hear it again. Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. Look up. Can you see it? All that has been taken so cruelly will be restored. Christ is risen. The grave is empty. Love is eternal. And death's defeat is sure. Nothing will be lost. Whether or not you can bear that great truth right now doesn't matter. Christ has given it to you. Amen. As we prepare for time of prayer, we invite you to join us in singing Spirit of God, found in the Black Hymnal, number 2117. We'll sing the first and last stanzas. Spirit of God, right hand, right that bit we come to this time of prayers of the people, you might want to open up the prayer list that we insert in worship material. It's also available in our Friday announcements. If you want to add something in our prayer list, you can write that on your registration card or you can email it to the church office. You might just, as we pray, you might want to call up in your mind and heart some of those concerns that you bring or some that are in our prayer list. We invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. We call upon you, O God, in the midst of the fullness of life, the joy and the sorrow. And we pray that we can be up to something good for ourselves and our congregation, for our neighborhoods and our world. We lift our thankful hearts for these uplifting acts of goodness. We are grateful for your faithfulness and the power to raise us from bleak valleys of death to new life. We give you thanks for the life of Ryan Dickerson, who's remembered by his parents in our altar flowers. 
We give thanks and we honor all of those dear to us as we are remembering and honoring those listed through the celebration of all of our Easter flowers this day and that remind us of new life in you. We give thanks for the ministry of Habitat for Humanity, Merced and Stanislaw, and for Love Modesto as they model your love through building vibrant communities. We give thanks for all of our first responders in law enforcement and medical care and for rescue workers. We pray protection for them and we pray that they will be wise and skillful and compassionate and just in their work for us. Even today, O oh God, when we proclaim that there is always life in the midst of death, we have much to lament. Incline your ear and extend your love and healing powers for our laments. We ask you for a miraculous healing of the atrocities in Gaza and Israel and in their relationship. In the face of generations of intractable conflict and war and violence, terror and death to tens of thousands of innocent people who are also your beloved. We ask you for peace with justice in the face of the war in Ukraine. We ask you for healing and comfort for the city of Baltimore, for the families who lost loved ones when the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed this week. We call upon you, O oh God, to give us the strength and courage to be up to something good for the sake of the good. In this moment, inspire our imagination as we again commit to one small thing this week that will lift someone up, elevate and affirm the good when we see it, and bring a bit more justice and joy where we are. And if we are, feel we're not up to it, we pray we will have the humility and openness to accept the goodness of others and feel your encouraging love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In this next section of worship, it's a time for us to consider our own discipleship, how we might support the ministry of our own congregation and beyond in some way. Uh, you might feel called to make a financial investment in our ministries, not required, of course, and all the ways you can do that will be on the screen. But I want to mention that at Easter, we're taking a special offering beyond our normal giving. Uh, all of it's gonna go beyond the walls and we're splitting it between two organizations. Half of it is gonna go to Habitat for Humanity, Stanislaw Merced. And their CEO, Anita Hellam, was here a couple weeks ago sharing with us that in addition to continuing to build new homes, they're partnering with Legacy Alliance Outreach who, who ministers to recently released people from some kind of incarceration. And Anita is hiring those people to help with some of the flood restoration of so many homes, especially for farm workers that were destroyed in the floods last year. And uh, in fact, Michael Baldwin, who is the CEO of Legacy Alliance Outreach, will be here with us next Sunday to share his own testimony and to tell us more about their ministry. And I encourage you to come, you will not be sorry. The other uh, partner, the other half is going to love Modesto. And I think many of you are familiar with their work. They provide this like one-time community event for over 100 cities across the country, the Love Our Cities part. And Love Modesto is coming up at the end of April, the last Saturday of April. And they provide us this amazing time for all of us to work across our traditions in various projects that bring healing and vibrancy to our community as a way of getting a taste of how we might sort of continue our discipleship throughout the year. 
I want to also remind especially parents that right after the service we're going to have a fun Easter egg hunt on our front lawn and the kids are going to gather on the front steps so you can get out there and meet them with your phone. You can take pictures in front of the flower cross and enjoy that time of celebration. You might also look through other uh, the events page in the insert to say, you know, what, what might you do to in discipleship to grow in your own faith? And there's a couple things I want to mention. Uh, starting next Sunday, we're going to do a seven-week series called Resurrection Stories, and we're going to savor resurrection and hear testimonies from many people in our congregation about how life came from death in their own lives as we consider the various resurrection stories of Jesus. And also, there's a new Bible study starting on April 14th. Uh, we believe in being change makers uh, as an expression of our Christian faith. And so a couple of our change maker leaders are going to be leading a six-session Bible study called Jesus' Change Maker. It's going to take place every other Sunday right after worship. And so if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to the Christian faith, or you've been at it a long time, I think you will really appreciate this time to gather and discuss these stories. Now, during the season of Lent, every week we had little sticky notes shaped like hot air balloons. You can see that the hot air balloons have been our theme this season because they remind us to look up and consider uh, our lives from God's perspective and also to remind us what can we be up to on our own discipleship. So we wrote uplifting messages to the world, and so now we've placed them along the walls and there are some still back in our mural in the narthex. And so what we're doing is we're inviting you to take a couple with you. Some of them are blank. You might want to grab a blank one and write your own if nothing strikes. And we're going to ask you to take them home with you and then leave them somewhere, maybe at the bank, maybe at the checkout counter when you're buying groceries, uh, somewhere randomly where someone might receive this uplifting message and be encouraged in their work that day. Maybe in a restaurant when you see a frazzled server, they might need an uplifting message. You know, Sunday brunch is the, when all the Christians come are the worst time for restaurants, you know that? <laughs> we tend to be the grouchiest and least tipping customers. So especially if you go out to brunch, leave one of them a big tip and a little hot air balloon of encouragement. Find some way to be up to something good uh, with uplifting messages for other people. Let us now continue our worship as we hear the offertory.
Please stand as we sing the doxology. There will be new words set to our familiar tune. Spirit of Resurrection, we ask you to raise up these gifts in ways that we could not imagine. Lift up our heads and our hearts as Easter people who faithfully believe there is something we can be up to for the good of this world. So be it. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, Up From the Grave He Arose, which you may find in the red hymnal, number 322. The lyrics will also be on the screen. Whenever you feel down, you can look up. Look up and notice that life can't help itself. It continues renewal all around you. In spite of how you're feeling at any one time in your life, know that you are loved. Your life matters. That your life can be lifted up and you can lift up those around you. You have all you need to be up to something. When someone asks you, what are you up to? You can respond with, with God's, God's help. help. I'm, I'm up, up to something, something good. good. Let the people say amen. Amen. amen.
Jesus' name.